Hello, survivors, and welcome to Life Torch, a The House of the Dead podcast by Resident Evil fans for Resident Evil fans. This is First Aid Spray, bonus episode 14, and this time we find ourselves in a spooky old house full of zombies once again, but not just from the comfort of our own homes, but also our local arcades. This is the history of the House of the Dead. I'm your host, Sai, and joining me in the Curian Mansion this week, dogs of the AMS. Time they made a move. It's fire button Steve Valance. Hello. I've been waiting for you, friends. From Steamforge Games, it's Sherwin Matthews. I won't be G. It's no fun. <laughs> I have made a creature to rule over mankind. From Serial Box 64, it's Jordan Sugru. Hello, folks. The subject of this bonus episode, like all others, was voted on by our Patreon backers. Support the show now to not only help keep us afloat, but also to create new content, select what that content is, and hear it a month before everyone else. Tears begin at just $1 a month. Check out patreon.com forward slash FA Spray Pod for the full breakdown. Our shout out for this episode, the musical contribution comes from House of the Remix, which is a channel I was very happy to come across. Um... You know, personally speaking, from the outside, I figured that the House of the Dead sort of online fan community is probably the smallest one of all the games we've talked about in the past, considering it's been, you know, massive franchises like Silent Hill and Metal Gear and stuff like that. So I was very happy to find Diego's channel. Um, he's done a lot of House of the Dead for Minecraft crossover stuff, which is quite interesting. Uh, and more than that, he has covered the entire soundtracks for House of the Dead 1, 2, 3, and 4, and they're all very, very good. So I've selected one. We're going to drop that into this episode to break up the discussion. And if you like what you hear, the link for House of the Remix is in the channel, uh, is in the podcast description, sorry. So you can check out that channel. Thank you, Diego, for your contribution. Um, in terms of how we got to this episode, um, this is the second time that House of the Dead has been up on the poll. When we do the polls, it's not like we're picking stuff that we know absolutely won't win, so we don't need to worry about it. Everything we pick is a subject that we'd like to talk about someday, so it's nice to do polls where we can bring stuff back for a second chance. And this second chance poll was a yeah, it's a fiery one. Um, out of all three options, at different times of the week, something was winning, but House of the Dead snuck ahead slightly at the end there. So we're going to be handling this much in the same way we did with our Castlevania special, talking about sort of the history of the first game, talking about the first game, and then from there just kind of hitting along all of the sequels. There isn't a huge amount of um, you sort of standalone House of Dead games, some various adaptions and stuff. So we don't have quite the same uh, ludicrous amount to pick from with Castlevania. So I think we'll talk a little bit about all of them if we're lucky. Uh, nonetheless, let's go right back to our individual experiences to start this one off. Uh, what was everybody's first interactions with the series? What's your earliest memory of House of the Dead, whether that's at home or, as I said, the arcade, which is something I'm excited to talk about. We haven't talked about any arcade uh, memories before. So, Steve, what was your first House of the Dead experience? Uh, I get the feeling that I'm not going to be the only one, but it was the arcade. <laughs> uh, it was very much a uh, holiday in, you know... It, the coasts of England back mm. when they had arcades that weren't just like, you know, slot machines and things. They, they had like, fighting games. Yeah, they had all <laughs> sorts. And it was sandwiched between like, you know, your dino and not your, dino, your time crises and your Tekkens and things like that. It was awesome, honestly. Uh, I was way too young to be playing it though. So I had to watch my dad play it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Which is funny because we've been, me and my brother, have been playing Resident Evil this <laughs> entire time. Uh, but no, it, yeah, it was it was fun to see. I didn't get my hands on it until like I were well on to like House of the Dead three and stuff like mm. that. So I, I, my first time playing it is on a friend's Dreamcast, and it must have been the early two thousands or something. And that might have been House of the Dead two. Now I think about it, my, my memory's a bit fuzzy. Yeah. But yeah, g generally fun times, although passive. <laughs> Oh, okay, interesting. That's interesting. Uh, Sherwin, what was your first House of the Dead experience? Uh, do you know, I'm trying to remember. It must have been House of the Dead 1 mm. uh, and was at a, uh, a bowling alley of all places, which has kind mm. of got an arcade attached to it, um, about, I don't know, 10, 15 miles away from where I lived back in the day. And, um, yeah, it was around about the time that kind of games like Time Crisis and House of the Dead and so on first started really existing in those sort of places. Um I'm really str I really struggle with House of the Dead, kind of any of them, to detach them in my 
mine from locations like that. That's the only way I ever really think about House of the Dead <laughs> is in that kind of format. Like, that's the only way I really remember them. Um, quite affectionately, I should add. Um, I think they're just part of my growing up kind of period, really, experiencing them that way. Yeah, I have... Uh... I have some warm, fuzzy feelings about House of the Dead, certainly. It's gonna, it's it's hard to sort of detach from those memories a little bit with this series. Um, Jordan, what was your first House of the Dead game, and, and was it the arcade as well? Yeah, it was the, it was the arcade, and um, yeah, you do you do end up <clears throat> associating uh, the, these particular games with specific locations. I mean, I think the first place that I actually saw, you know, the original House of the Dead uh, as an arcade cabinet was... Alton Towers, um, mm. they have like a, you know, more of a sort of a, a casual area where you've got the restaurants and the arcades and stuff like that. I think it's by the Rapids. This was back in 97 or something like that. And um, yeah, I remember seeing the, the machine there. I don't know if I actually played it at the time because I was just busy watching like the attract mode, which obviously has a whole lengthy demo and stuff like that. Mm. Um but at the time, because I hadn't seen it anywhere else, I was convinced that it was just made by Alton Towers. I just thought that it was their <laughs> thing. I was like, wow. That's and then like, I'd see it in like cinemas, and I'd be like, wow, did Alton Tower know about it? Did they know it's being used elsewhere? <laughs> <laughs> wasn't a bright kid. Um, but yeah, and uh, it's, it's, it's perfectly placed as, as a game um, when, you're, when you're coming from a cinema, because you might have just left an action movie mm. and now you can play a little mini action movie it was alongside like uh time crisis and time crisis 2 it just it, it was the right place to put those kind of machines because it was just so engaging mm. yes i mem- remember many sort of a, a a kid's birthday sort of gathering slash party where it was like go to the cinema then go to the arcade that's right next to it and uh even if it wasn't necessarily playing the games, just sort of be fascinated by the attract mode. As you said, the House of Dead ones really does sort of stick out in my memory for whatever reason. I don't know if there was one in sort of my most local arcade, possibly briefly. Um, but I definitely remember playing it on holiday at some point. As Steve said some some various coast of the UK, they were everywhere. Um, so I definitely played it in the arcade. I struggle to remember if that was first or second. I think possibly possibly i saw it in the arcade maybe didn't play it but i do have strong memories of playing it for the pc more than the arcade um because um there was i'm gonna might might blow some sort of nostalgia sort of dust off of people's heads with this one there was a there was a little company in the uk called explosive without any e's in it yeah there we go starting in an x and ending in a v um and they used to publish various um japanese games more, more than anything else, for power regions for the PC and port them over to the PC. Um, if you actually look them up on Wikipedia, they ported quite a few heavy hitters. For me, when I think of the sort of like fiery background of the, uh, the DVD case, DVD-shaped PC case, um, I think of the Sonic games. Some of them came to PC, and I think of House of the Dead. Um, and these, these were really cheap. As well, you could pick these kind of ports up for five, ten pounds somewhere, you know, anywhere, not just gaming stores like Matalan and stuff like that. Um, and I, de- I had the House of the Dead PC uh, port definitely. Um, so I remember playing the playing that a ton. As I've said in previous podcasts, just sort of being a young kid fascinated with zombies, I was just into it. Whether or not it was before Resident Evil, I couldn't tell you, but uh, it's a very tucked away memory of that the windows 95 house of the dead uh, so let's talk about the original game which came to arcades in september september 13th specifically 1996 in japan and then march 1997 around the west of the world um, so later this year it will be celebrating its 25th anniversary much like resident evil um, and then over the course of 1998 as i say it will come to pc and it also came to the sega saturn as well um i did have a quick look i thought oh, you know out of all the games we're going to talk about today i only got to replay a couple of them and i really wanted to replay house of dead one and i'm sure we'll talk about it and i looked at the sega saturn port i was very tempted but they're something like a hundred pound now which is a real shame because i really did want to uh, revisit this um so that's yeah that's house of the dead one what do we think of it you know, do you remember what you thought of it back then when we played it the first time? What do we think of it now? I imagine most of us haven't had a chance to replay it in quite some time. 
Um, Steve, thoughts on the quality of the original House of the Dead? I mean, you have to look at it in the time frame it came out. Of course. Honestly, I, think it, I honestly think it's fairly solid. Like, I, 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 this is total nostalgia bl- blindness. But I feel like the visuals that they use uh, uh, still hold up for me in a kitschy, like, fashion. You know, there, there's something very charming about the way they're designed. Um, and the soundtrack is very much my kind of thing. It's like, you know, that 90s uh, heavy techno and uh, dance music, which mm. is exactly what you want in a horror-themed game with <laughs> zombies. Uh, but, but no, it's it's, 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 it's strange. Because you think about it when it's like, it, it's contemporary at the time would be, what, Virtua Cop and... Time crisis, most right. most likely, yeah. Uh, th- there is like in this, it's all fast movement. You don't control the camera, but you're moving all the time, as opposed to statically standing in place and a gun either zooms in or you're popping in and out of cover. And you have to dismember zombies or react to them fast or shoot scientists. It's a lo- it's a lot more in depth compared to the stuff at the time. And honestly, uh, it's a fun old time. Uh, it's got multiple routes and things like that as well, which is. Nice, and I think novel for the time as well. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of for the time in that sentence. I apologise. It's just uh, as was the style at the time. <laughs> You're right. Context is completely key, and you've hit on a really major thing that was what kind of made it stand out. Um, this game was sort of produced by Sega AM2 as a response to their colleagues in Sega AM1 who had made Virtua Cop, which is a very different game. Um, as you said, popping in and out of cover, you're, you're playing against um, AI that also has weapons, you know, so it's it's all about long range and just getting your shot off precisely and quickly. Whereas they had to really uh, start from scratch when they came up with, well, we not can't just make another cop uh, first person shooter on Rails game. What, what would be the point of that? We already have Virtua Cop. So they went in a horror direction with it. And that has to, yeah, everything has to change at that point because, you know, Save for a few that throw knives and stuff and might have an axe or something. You know, none of these zombies are firing weapons. Nobody's hiding behind cover. Um, it's much more frenetic because of it, because things are running right at you. Um, Jordan, what was your... Do you remember how, how you felt about House of the Dead at the time? And how do you feel about it now? I remember finding it really scary. Just mm. just seeing it as a kid, um, especially kind of the... I always, thought, I always thought the logo was quite kind of creepy because... Um, You've got like the silhouette of the the figure sort of shuffling along, and I, I could, for some reason, it always made my like mind go to the place. Oh, is that a zombie, or is that, you know, like the main character that's just being turned into a zombie, or something <laughs> like that? You know, my mind went wild with that. But um, but yeah, it was it was kind of even though, looking back, I look at it and I'm like, why was I ever scared? Because it's kind of like it is quite janky and and silly, and you know, the music's all kind of upbeat and stuff. But I suppose it's because of of how intense it was. Um, it, it it's 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 one of those shooters. That I I don't know if any of the House of the Dead games have had like a foot pedal for for dodging or anything like that. So just about everything is is head on. Mm. Um, and you kind of it it kind of just boils down to if you can shoot faster than you can get hit. Yes. Um, there there really isn't. Uh, you know, when you're when you're fighting bosses, you're kind of expecting to take some damage, and uh, so it's just up to you and possibly a friend to just try and uh, focus as much of your firepower as possible um, on whichever enemy is the biggest threat at the time. But um, yeah, I mean, I have not played it in years. I, in fact, the last time that I probably played it was Typing of the Dead, and we can get into that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I think as far as House of the Dead games. It was a it was a massive inf- introduction. Like I I never forgot it. Um, but it was almost like the hype from just seeing that game was what spurred me to then eventually play most of the other games quite obsessively later on. Mm. Um, but kind of uh, you know go, going back to it now, I can still remember it so fondly despite the fact it's been so many years. So it just goes to show you how effective it was. Um, you know, even if you're only catching a glance of it when you're in a bowling alley or cinema um it it says a lot about the impact it had and especially at that time because like arcades are still massive everything's trying to get your attention Mm. and and yet house of the dead you know still remains kind of like a highlight of that period um you know only really time crisis comes comes close even then i'd say that 
House of the Dead has the edge. Yes, you're right. This is the sort of the last era almost of where arcade games were more powerful uh, than the home console. After a certain point beyond this, it kind of at least becomes less obvious that arcades can do can do or, or rather home consoles can't do quite as much as their arcade counterparts because this was yeah when it came out i'm sure it was like a, it was a bit of a wow one definitely with its sequels and stuff which we'll talk about what they were doing as well um and and yeah just the when you think about that opening section of the original house of the dead where you're just going through the courtyard the amount of stuff it throws at you um within those first few minutes i thought i could sort of relive it in my head if i just sort of like shut my eyes the amount of times i played it but i watched a youtube playthrough and as i was watching it it was coming back i was like oh yeah forgot about the sort of like swampy looking zombie that comes out of the fountain and there's flying things here and it's just constantly throwing like totally different things at you all the way along the way and as steve mentioned multiple pathways and stuff like that it's just really exciting because there was a lot to sort of bite into, haha, ha, pun unintended, with this. Um, Sherwin, what was your first reaction to House of the Dead back in the day, and how do you feel about it now? You know, I don't really remember, like, um, I don't really remember, like, first reactions. I, I remember being kind of enraptured by it as a game, like, as a kid, but I, my honest, I honestly remember playing House of the Dead 2 a lot more mm-hmm. than I remember the original, which means, which says to me that the first one I probably found in one or two places and maybe played a little bit or stared in rap fascination and then never actually really got to play as much, whereas right. the others um, I had much more experience of. So I think House of the Dead 2, if memory serves, I remember like seeing that everywhere. Like, I remember seeing cabinets for that all over the show, whereas House of the Dead 1, I think, was more of a... You'd occasionally find that pushed to like, the back of an arcade somewhere after a period of time, like mm. you know, where it's kind of existed since the dawn of time. But... um. Yeah, just to echo everything else you guys have said, like it really was a, it really is a, a game where I remember. I think, like the best part, the 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 best best part about it, I do honestly do remember is the voice acting, which we will absolutely get onto in time. <laughs> but um, that that part really stands out as memory, and I know what you mean about the courtyard and everything else. But just thinking about it in preparation for this show, and again to what you guys were saying about um, throwing him in at the deep end. What I think is so remarkable about the original House of the Dead, um, or in fact all of them, is just how little onboarding there is. Yeah. You kind of, it's grab your gun and go. Yeah. And you can work out that shooting things is a good idea along the way. And you'll work out kind of that, you know, there are different paths you could take or whatever else later on. And the soundtrack is perfect for, you know, the location. It's not trying to be Resident Evil where everything is kind of very atmospheric and very immersive or anything else because half the time you're in a place which has got music playing anyway which sounds kind of like what the soundtrack of the game does so it's just kind of amping that up really <laughs> That's it's true. just it's just like your adrenaline hit um experience and it works it's it's just a it's just a solid thing and yeah it exists and it feels very much of its time but that doesn't take away any of its charm mm, you're right that um again something right at the beginning of the game it just teaches you hey you shouldn't shoot the humans <laughs> here's a human yeah. save him uh, he might give you a gift on you go you know if you run out of ammo the game starts screaming reload at you and eventually will tell you to shoot off of the screen that's how you figure out how to reload everything else that's it you know just just go as there's, there's, there's no heavy-handed tutorials it's 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 very much just put your yeah your and it's 50 not, it's not even holding up yeah and it's not even holding up like kind of well we'll just give you basic zombies to start with no. As you've just said, there's there's things coming from different angles all over the place. It is just literally all filler, no, oh sorry, all killer, no filler. Mm. It's just glorious. So it's really interesting as well because I don't know if it was meant to be a scary game necessarily, but I know it was meant to be serious. Um, apparently, some of the sort of designs, particularly sort of the playable characters, are based on, of all things, the film Seven. Um, but it's funny because oh, wow, I can believe that. Yeah, um, crazy. You know, it doesn't detract from it in the fact that when I say that it doesn't seem like that serious as a, of a game, and we'll definitely talk about that as we go down the series, certainly. Um, as Sherwin's mentioned, the the voice acting definitely uh, doesn't make it feel like a ooh, strong tone kind of... Yeah, it, it adds some levity to it. And the music as well, uh, I wouldn't say feels like super serious music. It's... It, feels just more about 
here's a piece of entertainment and it's entertaining don't worry about it um so i don't know how what the you know when you look into it they're trying to make a serious piece of media i don't quite know what the extent of that was but uh yeah i agree about the music and the voice acting is uh, well it gets worse <laughs> we'll talk about house of the dead too certainly that's uh that's a whole other thing there um in terms of the legacy of the game and again with House of Z 2 being the standout example, I do think it's still true of the first game that the voice acting is part of definitely one of the bigger parts of the legacy of House of the Dead. Um, but yeah, just arcade memories, just like we were saying. Uh, even if we didn't see House of the Dead 1 much at the time, and I agree, it wasn't the, the cabinet out of the lot of them that I saw the most, most certainly. But I remember seeing it, and I remember seeing it and thinking, oh, wow, what's that? Or, oh, it's that game. I'm desperate to just stare at it, even if I've got it at home. <laughs> um, uh, Steve, what's your thoughts on the, the overall legacy of House of the Dead 1? Honestly, I think it's under, underappreciated and overshadowed by its sequel sometimes. Mm. Uh, I actually prefer the... We'll get into it, but I prefer the gameplay of the first one. It just feels a little bit more punchy, and um, yeah, I, I fully admit... Total nostalgia blindness and prefer preferentials between them. Uh, yeah. I feel like it should, in some form, still be available to buy online. Because during, during the recording of this podcast, I've actually been looking for a way to legally buy it. Just, <laughs> just, just, just so I can play out my mm. PC again. Uh, Amazon is your only way, and it should be on modern systems. I, uh, I am fully annoyed at this. So, yeah, underappreciated gem. Yes, that's definitely something that I wanted to touch on most certainly is the availability like i say the sega saturn version goes for 100 pound at the moment which is a bit steep and yeah i like it just sort of a, makes you scratch your head that this never turned up on steam or epic game store or anything you know it's just a just a strange one i mean obviously there is a remake coming that's coming later this year it's a nice way to celebrate the 25th anniversary let's hope that's good and maybe kickstarts uh, a bit more of this kind of thing so we can have these games push forward. Availability is going to be something that comes up a little bit more in in future discussions of sequels. Uh, but I agree. I really wanted to replay this, but it's it doesn't seem to be out there right now. Uh, Jordan, what's your feelings on the legacy of the original House of the Dead? Well, it, it, it's funny, really, because uh, yeah, I, I think it probably is underappreciated. It's 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 fondly remembered, yet probably not uh, played. Uh, in, in relation to the rest of the series, mm. as much by uh, you know the fan base, you know, everybody remembers it. Uh, but it, you know when you actually then sit down and play it, you probably were thinking of House of the Dead Two. Like you remember <laughs> seeing House of the Dead One, but you probably played House of the Dead Two more. It, in a way, it kind of it feels a little bit like the original Street Fighter. But the difference there is that the original Street Fighter was was pretty rough. Um, and it was not obviously mm. the uh, you know the complete article. Whereas House of the Dead was obviously much closer to um, you know the, the foundation that was then going to carry the rest of the series. It's just that it hasn't been it hasn't been made available. Um, it, I mean, from what I understand, it's an issue with the uh, original source code. Oh, right. So you know if you if you're porting the Original House of the Dead now, I think it has to be through emulation. Um, so you're you're looking at whichever you know ports are available, and if that is just uh, either arcade board emulation, um, the original sort of like uh, you know uh, explosive PC release, um, or the Sega Saturn, it's a bit it's a bit of a tough one to work with because mm. you know none of those are necessarily the most optimal for. You know, producing a uh, a port these days, which is probably why they're going the remake route with right. it. That and it, it just seems appropriate that you know people kind of see it in a in a new light. Um, but yeah, it's it it's one of those games that uh, for for how little chance people get to play it, because you know, bear in mind these were location based experiences. It's mm. it wasn't something that you typically took home with you. Um, and uh, considering that, considering how little time people might have to play on it, especially if they, you know, only have like, you know, one pound in their pocket, uh, there's a lot that it stuck with people, you know, so strongly um, that whenever you then see a House of the Dead cabinet in a bowling alley or a cinema or a theme park or whatever, 
you have to play it. Yeah. You've got to give it a go. And they, and I I think that they've they've gotten you know better since the original House of the Dead. But yeah, it's it's a it's still a solid game, obviously. Um, and and that's probably because like the fundamentals of it are so nice and straightforward. Um, so that stuff never gets old. Hmm. Showing thoughts on uh, the legacy of the game and sort of lack of availability. Yeah, I, I think um, I think you're definitely right. The, the nail you hit on the head there was um, is is very much. Uh, you think about House of the Dead one. Chances are you're probably thinking about actually thinking about House of the Dead two. Mm. Um, I certainly have fallen afoul of that in a little bit thinking about the different um, thinking about the game and so on. I think it's in a weird way. I don't mind it being a game that isn't really available anymore. In the sense that, and that's not some sort of weird gatekeeping thing. It's more so much. I like the fact that people can look back on games and kind of remember them with sort of rose tinted glasses and or sort of you know rose tinted kind of views and go, that was really cool. That was really awesome. And there's a degree of it not being available anymore that almost enshrines it as this <laughs> sort of sacred thing. Yeah. And I quite like that feel to it because. If you were to play it, chances are it could be rough, it could be quite fun, whatever, but I think it kind of fits, and I think it's sort of preserved and saved from that point where you play it and then go, wow, like I remember really loving this thing as a kid, but I really don't now, for whatever reason. It's kind of kept safe inside its own little bubble. It's this mythic kind of creature. I quite like that. Um, its legacy is obviously, for me, it's it's the arcade shooter. People will talk about Time Crisis or you know whatever various other different games that came out of the similar sort of time, but for me that that was like the Titan that sort of strode across all of them. Um, it never really competed with Resident Evil for obvious reasons, but um, like you could have believed it back when it came out. Mm. You could have believed that if it was more available and it wasn't an arcade game, if there'd been sort of console follow-ups, this could have basically easily slipped into the uh, into the space that Resident Evil came to occupy. Um, just by nature of what it is, by being a similar sort of genre of killing zombies. So yeah, it's just a... I think back on this game very, very fondly, even though I must admit my buy-in and my level of um, appreciation and playing time is significantly lower than it is for a lot of other games. Mm. I still look back on this with a lot of affection. It's interesting, in an uh, interview with George A. Romero at one point, um, someone asked him about both those games, Um and their effect on, I don't want to say the zombie, zombie genre, because that's not really a thing, but zombies in media and the sort of the rise of them. And we talked about it in our episode earlier this year about Resident Evil 1. Um, and he said, yeah, both Resident Evil and House of the Dead were important in sort of bringing zombies back. Because at the time, they were comparable in the sense that they were brand new IPs uh, coming out around the same time. If you'd have gone back to 1996, uh, you could probably easily put them both up there on their own little pedestals of doing something different. Um, I think Resident Evil is obviously far and away the more successful of the two series, uh, just by nature of being the home console game. If nothing else, it's got more more places to go and more things it can do with House of the Dead being an arcade shooter. It, it maybe feels a little bit trapped in that, but we'll definitely talk about further games from that and how they've sort of worked on home consoles. It is interesting, though, that we haven't really touched on um, similarities, I guess. You know, it's, yeah, go to the spooky mansion where there's been uh, science experiments and a whole bunch of zombies have gotten out. Something about the pursuit of the ultimate life form. Um, they're both released in 96 um, and they're both set in 98, which is interesting. Um, and they both have a big scary voice as the title called. I wonder if something was in the water there or, or what, but I know House of the Dead was already in production before Resident Evil even came out, so it wasn't a case of necessarily copying uh, one for one, but you do have to wonder if they looked at some of it and went, oh, do you know what, let's make our game 1998. Let's, let's put a big doofy title called in our game as well. So either way, it's interesting. Which one's got the better voice acting? <laughs> <laughs> oh... That's uh, different strokes for different folks, surely. <laughs> That's my political answer. I'm not choosing sides. I was going to just yeah, ask, but... um, do we think that the magician could take the tyrant in a fight? Well, that's... <laughs> <laughs> he can fly, so it's a lot yeah. better than that turning circle. 
But which, but but you know, it, it's the age-old question between those two franchises. Which would you rather be? Would you rather be a resident, resident, or would you rather be a house? <laughs> Neither of which the title from either franchise makes sense as soon as you get to no. the first sequel. <laughs> well, there you go. Speaking of which, let's move to House of the Dead 2. I know several of us are very excited to talk about this one. Uh, released in November 1998 in the arcade um, and then came to the Dreamcast in March of 1999 in Japan and then September that year for the rest of the world. Um, I recently streamed some of this and House of Dead 3, and I think I said it, and I'm going to say it again now, is, as we're just saying, sort of like arcade games being ahead of the home consoles, is this game then, and still now for me, looks amazing for 1998 when you look at that footage. Such an incredible, much like Resident Evil 1 to Resident Evil 2, it's such a big jump as well. Uh, my first experiences with this. I'm trying to remember if I played it in the arcade at all, which is really interesting considering some of you have said it's the machine you saw the most. But I have so much nostalgia for this game because I had the Dreamcast uh, version and I could play it at home. I didn't get the, whatever the Dreamcast gun was called, the light gun, um, until much, much, much later. So I mostly just played it with the controller, which obviously makes it kind of a hell of a lot easier, really, to be honest. So does uh, a friend of my brother's coming over with a Dreamcast like essentially like a Game Shark disc, uh, and me downloading all of the House of the Dead items and just loading the game full of data to the point where I think if I get my Dreamcast out now still and try and play House of the Dead 2, after a few uh, chapters, the walls and the floor start disappearing because I think the saved data is just so full of stuff that it can't load anymore. <laughs> so I, that's not great. But yeah, this is the game that I have the most amount of nostalgia for. I, I played this to death. Uh, even to the point where I would just sit in the the sound test and just listen to the the thumping electronic music. I I, I surely do love me some House of the Dead too. Show and you said this is the one that you remember the most or stood out the most to you. Um, talk a little bit more about your experiences with House of the Dead too. Uh, same thing. I remember this arcade machine being everywhere, literally everywhere. Um, I remember wherever I would go that in you know any arcade there would be a House of the Dead two machine. Um, that said, uh, much like what you've you said, I, I played a whole bunch of it in the arcades, but it's the Dreamcast version that I remember the most. Mm. Um, I remember playing a whole bunch of it there. Um, and then I think, did it come out on the Wii? There was a version of... Yes, yes. yeah, it did. Yeah, um, I, remember, I remember one of my friends getting it for that as well. Mm. It's really interesting, actually. One of my friends, I mentioned this to her. Um, I said I'm recording a podcast for you guys later on about this, and... She kind of asked, do you think it's an arcade game or do you think it's a console game? Which is a really good question. Um, and I've got to be honest, I kind of landed at this point where I said, it's an arcade machine because I struggle to get out, I struggle to break that away, House of the Dead away from that in my mind. Mm. But at the same time, House of the Dead 2 really, really does push it. There's a realm of, I have a lot of memories of playing it on various different consoles. And I have a lot of memories of, of playing it at a friend's house versus in an arcade. So yeah, it's just um, this for me is is the definitive House of the Dead. Um, it's not about you know sequels, um, you know Resident Evil Two, House of the Dead Two. This mm -hmm. this for me is the definitive version of the game, and it's kind of got everything that you remember about House of the Dead in it, and none of the future refinements or whatever else. But that's fine. Like it just feels, I think for when it was released, this felt like it was really really sharp really really good it was a reason to go to the arcade it's a reason to experience it. it was fun it was awesome i think when you get on past this it's like past that era of sit of era of um of arcades where you kind of almost feel like they're a destination place you want to go to to play like games that are kind of beyond the level of consoles or whatever else mm. this is the point this is still a point where you go to the arcade to experience something you can't experience on a console somewhere along the way right. i don't i don't think when it first comes out anyway I think later result, later games after that are kind of on a sort of downward slope. So for me, this is a this is the big release for House of the Dead. If I had to pick a favourite, it would absolutely be this. No questions asked. Some of that's probably nostalgia, but whatever, live with it. Um, but I do think, in terms of gameplay, it yeah, sharp is the word you used. Completely agree with that. It's it's very sharp. It's very easy to, to just jump in and to go, and it feels good immediately. I was playing the Wii version when I was streaming it, and yeah, it's just 
it's still fun. It's there's not much yeah. to it, you know. Just it's just dumb shooting zombies in the face fun. That's and the home sort of versions. Um, I don't know if this is true of the House of the Dead versions because a I don't remember and b as we said it's it's hard to track down a copy to actually check. But House of the Dead two the Dreamcast version as well gave you more options to sort of mix up that gameplay. There's a bus uh, a boss rush mode and there's a yes. I think it's called original mode where you can take these items with you the way you know give yourself an extra long clip or more health or etc etc. So uh, I really appreciated that as well. Um, Jordan, what are your memories of House of the Dead two? Well, primarily it was that I wasn't very good at it, but <laughs> that was the great thing about the introduction of, well, a, a wider availability on home consoles, because uh, most of my gameplay experience with this game uh, you know, came from consoles back in the day. I can't remember exactly which system it was. I, f- I feel like it might have actually been the original Xbox, but uh, my, my friend had... I guess House of the Dead 3 or something like that, and it's like a, yes, a bonus or something. It is, yeah, it's unlockable. And uh, and it kind of, it like, it was the same thing when I got Time Crisis 2 for the for the PlayStation 2. Kind of felt like I was getting away with it. It's kind of like, <laughs> this is meant to be a hard game that costs a lot to play if you're not very good at it. And yet here I am, sitting at home, I can play this all hours of the day if I want, and I can have as many continues as I want. And that's kind of how it felt. Um, at the time, and the only kind of trade-off with that depended on your home setup. So, you know, it's like early 2000s, and, you know, we're kids, and, you know, somebody's game room is just basically an old, like, portable telly that's just... It was on the floor. So we're like, we're playing a light gun game, but the TV is on the floor, so we're gonna, like... It was really awkward. We either had to sort of, like, just sit and just aim down, or we had to basically lie on our fronts and and just shoot like we're, I don't know, snipers or something. It was not necessarily the experience I think they were intending us to Mm. have when they released that game. But still, it was awesome, because it was just, it was the fact that you could play it for as long as you like, and no, no other, nobody else is waiting to, you know, play the game after you, Mm. like, like you would at an arcade and stuff. So I think that's a main reason why it's probably uh, so pronounced in people's memories because there was so much access to it. Ah, and obviously it was a great game. I just wish I was better at it. I saw a lot of those screens where, uh, you know, you, you watch the agents kind of like run down the path that you took and yeah. then eventually yeah. like they, they keel yeah, over. That's right. It's like, right, that's, that's, <laughs> that's where you got to. Um, they always they always keeled over very fast for me. <laughs> <laughs> just quickly um, before we move, just, sorry, just quickly before we move on, Jordan, did you kill as many humans playing this game as Cy does when he plays it? <laughs> you know what? To be honest, that was probably why I was so bad at it because I was like trying to spare the humans so much that I didn't bother shooting the zombies as effectively. See, it's a legitimate oh, okay. tactic. Just shoot everything. <laughs> right? Yeah. Cy, Cy doesn't distinguish. Cy is literally the guy. Who like played Silent Hill three and they were, wait you see them all as like demons or what? You know, <laughs> that, that, you see them as monsters. That's literally you, sir. You're just gunning down everything that moves, and then someone says there were humans there. Really? Didn't see that. <laughs> in in size defense, they could be infected and just you know covering it up, making sure that's no right. Witnesses. I'll make I'm yeah. saving them now instead of letting them go through the trauma. <laughs> <laughs> that human was clearly a decoy made of cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, thoughts on House of the Dead two? One of the uh, strangest interpretations of Venice I've seen in a video game. <laughs> and I've played, like, Assassin's Creed 2, I've played Tomb Raider 2, and I believe this rounds out as how... Yeah, if a video game sequel doth exist, there is a not 0% chance your game will be set in Venice. Uh, <laughs> no, no, but this is... Uh, it's I can, I can see why it's everyone's favourite. It's got so many, like, great things going on about it. Main, mainly, I think it's memed on nowadays for the voice acting. Right. Soundtrack is just, if not better, than the original. Uh, I, I think the aesthetic's a little bit lesser for me because it feels a little bit too, uh, you know, stony and uh, kind of dreary. Oh, well, it's, it's great the first few levels where you go to like, the back streets and things. And it's also, I think, the first light gun game where I tried to look cool and put two pounds into a machine so I could wield both guns <laughs> at the same time. Never works, does it? My- no. <laughs> yeah. 
basket. Um, but no, I, my distinctest my distinctest memory is getting to what I think is the Colosseum, and then being chased by a giant dude with a chainsaw, and it becomes a template boss for the rest of the series. And mm. it's just such a great fight because the boss fights in this are hit and miss, but there's some fantastic ones like you're fighting a um, a giant set of armor and he's got a little imp flying around him and the imp is the target. You shoot him to stun the giant dude. And then you've got, you know, Magician comes back because why not bring back the previous game's last boss as a uh, mini a mid-boss mm. for the second to final level. So, uh, we haven't really touched on the boss fights, have we? No, not so um, far. Right, the, 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 they're a bit quarter eaty for the uh, era. I think that's mm. the term, right? Where they're just trying to Bilk you, but there are ways to beat them without, you know, taking any hits. It's just, uh, I think they're probably at their most inventive here in this in this ep- uh, in this game, or it's between this one and the third one for me in terms of boss fight quality. Mm. Uh, so I've oh, yeah, it's a good little game, and the voice acting alone sets it apart. Like it is easily, if anyone says Resident Evil has the worst voice acting, they have not lived. They need to get under that rock, get out from under that rock, and play House of Dead too, because my God, there are some gems. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. if there's a legacy of this game, it probably <laughs> it's probably that. Unfortunately, if you what you know, if you just YouTube worst video game voice acting sort of like compilations, guaranteed you're gonna get a lot of House of the Dead too. I mean, all the intros this week, I was like, well, this is easy. I don't have to come up with anything. I've just got to mention stupid lines from that game because it's so bad. Just it constantly. works into it. It, it works into the total madness because you can save a fat, balding man in a sewer who's going, ah, please save me, followed by, thank you, sir. You know, it's <laughs> complete madness tone shifts. It's just, it, it keeps it feeling very light and uh, silly, mm-hmm. which is strange when you can see the grotesqueness of the nature of the game, but uh, yeah. I, uh, my, fav- my favourite moment of the voice acting is actually just before the part you're talking about in uh, when they're in the boat and they're travelling through. And one of the agents excitedly turns around to your character and says, the, you know, I've been looking into the Kyrian case. Guess who was behind it? And then when you just don't give him anything, he's like, it was Goldman. <laughs> Quiet voice. Like, yeah, that's it. Just, just completely defeated. Like, it was Goldman. It's just amazing. Those two uh, sort Honestly. of like agents who travel with you throughout the game are pretty terrible, to be honest. I mean, everyone goes to Goldman for, for the classics. And he is dreadful, of course. But... I think people need to realise that it's not just him. The whole cast are pretty terrible. And as Steve said, even just the random civilians just make me laugh. They've always made me laugh. The way they emphasise all the wrong words and stuff like that. Uh, Jordan, any standout voice acting woes from uh, House of the Dead 2 for you? Well, certainly not any woes. I mean, uh, yeah, I think uh, if, you, if you were to kind of like edge House of the Dead over Resident Evil in terms of, you know, some of the voice acting... I would say it's the the little imp voices, the little <laughs> high pitched imp voices. They're so naff, but they work so well. Um, and I'm I'm very grateful that House of the Dead, as a series, um, despite you know having quite a a, a long life, uh, seemed to get relatively uns get out of the sort of the the mid two thousands relatively unscathed from the uh, gritty reboot era mm. where everything mm. was. Trying to be a bit more realistic, trying to be a bit more serious, and th- thankfully, House of the Dead just kind of kept being its schlocky self. And even yeah. when it did tone itself down a little bit, it was never, never close to being realistic or being toned down in a, in any kind of serious manner. Mm. Um, so I'm just, I'm just glad that it is a, now a fixture. Um, I think back then it was, uh, it, it was, it was something that was just sort of accepted as part of maybe the budget um or just part of the kind of the the culture of games at the time where typically you were outsourcing the voiceover and they weren't really given any kind of direction um but now it's just because you almost expect it you know if they release the house of the game now with serious voice acting you know Kiefer sutherland in in the main role or something like that <laughs> um it would throw you off you would think what's well, going on this is house of the dead this this should be jarring i i should be wincing at just how bad these lines are so i'm glad that that at least is still fixture yes yeah 100 percent agree with that um I, again i don't know how serious they were taking the games or whatever at this point um but it's it's going to become clear uh that 
they weren't interested in that sort of gritty reboot as as you mentioned uh because before we move on to house of the dead 3 there is one last house of the dead 2 thing we need to talk about which is the typing of the dead um for those of you listening who may not even be aware of this um it's pretty self-explanatory really the typing of the dead plug in your dreamcast keyboard and uh yeah type to your heart's content to take out the oncoming zombies just spell out the words in front of you um i don't know why this was a thing but i'm very glad that it was i don't recall if i ever got a chance to play it maybe once i never owned the dreamcast keyboard um i know there are some pc versions out there um japan made several versions of the typing of the dead which were all house of the dead 2 just sort of updates um and typing of the dead overkill is on steam so that's something at least um has anyone had any experience with typing of the dead steve did you ever get to play typing of the dead or what are your thoughts on it I remember playing my friend's Dreamcast, but it's been a million billion years ago, honestly. Um, it's very much a, you know, word appears on screen, type it in. I think you, like, tap a key to shift between them, but it's it's been that long. Mm. And uh, for added benefit, I did look up a bit about the Overkill version on PC. Uh, you can actually switch to just playing it with your mouse and keyboard as a uh, rail shooter oh, as well. Nice. So that's kind of feature complete mm, in cool. that regard. It seems odd that they call it Typing of the Dead Overkill then and not just House of the Dead Overkill yeah. with the typing bit or so. <laughs> there you go. I, I, I badly. I, you know, I would love to see like a, a no-clip documentary or something mm. onto the concept of the meeting that led to this game's development. <laughs> right. Because, it, you know, as, can you imagine being at school and then like, you know, a, a old nice teacher person comes like, okay, kids, today we're going to do some typing lessons. And then they bang this out. You, you'd be well away. You'd want to be on school every day. You'd be there Saturday. You'd be there Sunday. You'd be there, you know, <laughs> frantic music, shooting zombies while hammering a keyboard. Educational. You know, it, it does all the things you need. <laughs> Educational and gory. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I like to feel that this game. I like to feel that this game is something which is either in the Japanese government to get more kids doing their homework, <laughs> or alternatively, it's something which you know. Um, was used to kind of hire secretaries for the company that for Sega. So they sort of sit down. They're like, right. So you know, ha- can you touch type? Yes. Okay. Well, do you want to go and see how far you get? <laughs> and then that's kind of what that's that's part of your interview. Just see how far you can do. It's a good incentive. I'm down, I'm down so. for it. It's uh, it's definitely sort of spun off really as well. There's as I say various sort of re-releases. There's a DS game. Um, it just sort of allowed that to roll in its own direction to the point where. There's even like a darts of the dead where you play darts to kill the zombies. That's a thing. So, you know, it, it the lid is well and truly off by this point of let's just go nuts with it. Jordan, uh, what are your thoughts on typing of the dead? Well, uh, I think it was actually one of the earliest, one of the very first PC games that I ever pirated online. <laughs> <laughs> So this is like back in the day when you you get PC games on on CD ROMs, and uh, I don't know how well this was known, but if your friend had like a, you know a PC copy of a game, and obviously it had the product key, you know they could install it on their system, and then come over to yours and install it on your system. Um, that wasn't the case with with Type in the Dead because to be quite honest, I did not know about it until I saw it on it probably wasn't Napster, it was probably some, something else, um, but. I saw it, and to be honest, I didn't think it was a real game. I just saw Typing of the Dead. I was like, isn't it supposed to be House of the Dead? And then um, and then I downloaded it. I was like, oh, of course, because, like, 90s especially was mm. just mass- massively uh, saturated with, with typing games. <laughs> and, um, you know, most of my typing game experience had come from Adventures in Typing with Timon and Pumbaa. And uh, <laughs> let me just say, that was entry-level. Um, but typing of the dead was the real stuff. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. That was, it's, it's such a great way of, I have no idea if it's actually got any applicable, you know, typing skills, but it is such a great way to get you, uh, it, it engaged with, um, touch typing in that kind of manner. And, mm. you know, it, it's obviously at a kind of speed, um, and a maturity that's probably above what Timon and Pumbaa unfortunately could teach me. <laughs> but um, yeah, I have I haven't played it in years. But it's one of those it's one of those games which 
I love that it exists. I love that mm. the concept of it exists. I love the name of it. Typing of the Dead is, is ridiculous. Um, <laughs> the only other experience I've had besides that, and I haven't played, I know they, they did pr uh, produce the Overkill version. I've not played that, but um, I do remember years ago, uh, Screw Attack, I think, released an app for the iPhone um, back in the very early days that was sort of a homage to oh, right. um typing of the dead and it's called i think it was called texting of the bread because they could they oh, couldn't have zombies so wow, they had like yeah. they had zombie gingerbread men that you gotta you gotta shoot and stuff like that but um and again like you know work the same way it's i don't know who came up with that who who kind of married the idea of light gun games and typing and said this works in fact this works too well i'm scared <laughs> but i'm glad they did Well, with that in the rear view, let's move on to House of the Dead's uh, House of the Dead 2's true sequel, which is of course House of the Dead 3. So House of the Dead 3 was released in arcades June 1st, 2002, and then it came to Xbox uh, the same year and the following year, depending on where you were, October 24th, 2002, uh, March 14th, 2003 in Europe and January 30th, 2003 in Japan. Also came to Windows and the PlayStation 3 available via PSN. Uh, this was the one that, for me, I saw the most in arcades for a long time. And I wonder if that's because uh, between this and 4, there is another non-arcade game. Although that was 2009, so I don't... Yeah, it's because it's like... It came out in 2002, and we didn't really see another House of the Dead game for many, many years. Perhaps that's why. Perhaps it was just the age where I was just going to arcades more. I don't know. Um, but I remember House of the Dead 3 being a fixture of every arcade I went to for years. It was always there. Um, it pretty much pushed the first two games out of the way. Occasionally, you'd see the House of the Dead 1 cabinet, maybe. But uh, House of Dead 3 was definitely the one that I saw the most. Um, in terms of revision to the game, there's not a whole lot of changes uh, other than the fact that it, you know, it's a step up in graphics and stuff like that. You've got all your alternative routes that you can pick 
where this time now basically after finishing mission one you get to choose the order of two three and four which sort of determines what ending you get and for the first time ever you're swapping out a handgun for a shotgun which was kind of cool that was probably the thing that stands out the most uh, for most people that play this in arcade i'd imagine is that you had the shotgun where you would pull the uh pull the barrel uh, back and forth to reload rather than shoot off of the uh, screen, which is pretty cool. Uh, Sherwin, do you have any memories of House of the Dead 3? Uh, the shotgun is the really obvious one. Mm. Um, and how often you found that in an arcade an arcade cabinet where it was broken. Uh, that was oh, really right. pretty good. <laughs> Great. Um, because apparently people where I am around this part of the world uh, are heavy-handed. Mm. But no, it was... Um, I never played this one as much. I remember discovering it and then only one place and um, and playing it a bunch and being surprised by its existence. And But at that point, it, so many elements of it just felt kind of like it... Like the first two kind of came out and you played them, you're like, these are cool. And then by the time I got to the third one, I kind of landed at this point of like, yeah, I've kind of seen all this stuff before. Like, I don't, I'm not really particularly inspired by this. Like, other games have done craziness or over the top kind of elements or visuals or sounds or whatever like the gameplay is more or less the same as before and it just felt kind of a bit tired um, for whatever reason it just never resonated with me um and as a result i just never really felt particularly engaged by it and i remember playing it a few times then but mostly just you know probably almost out of habit as it were um, yeah. and then at that point just not just not ever really bothering with it i don't really think back to this one with any sense of uh, nostalgia in the same way which is a shame um because if memory serves this is the uh this is the Trevor family, right? Uh, this That's is the right. Resident Evil crossover that no one knows about. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Uh. <laughs> Playable characters, Lisa and G, clearly the Trevors. The G standing for George. Yeah. That's obviously what it is. Um, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm in a similar direction. I do. There is some nostalgia for this one for me. I did play it a heck of a lot. Although I do wonder a little bit if, like you say, I just was playing it because it was House of the Dead and I was in an arcade and, you know one and one make two you know i just I had to it's there it's the house of dead game that's there i was never overly interested in uh, time crisis and stuff like that it was all about house of the dead so i would always pick this over whatever else was around in terms of a shooting game um it's decent fun but you're right it's a little bit you know more drab than house of the dead 2 um and perhaps controversially for any house of dead super fans that are listening i will say talking about characters like lisa who is the daughter of the House of the Dead 1 protagonist, and G being the other House of the Dead 1 protagonist. It is kind of cool, in a way, that House of the Dead has these sort of through lines of plot and through lines of characters. You sort of, you can see these characters show up multiple times and their partners and their you know children and stuff like that. That's kind of neat. There is an ongoing story. But when you're in the arcade, you don't really care about flashbacks, about, you know, Curian's sun and stuff like that this one's a little bit too heavy on the story and stuff like that maybe that doesn't help it either um jordan what are your memories for house of the dead 3 it's very limited actually um I, I, the only real experience that i had c kind of growing up with it uh was when i was playing it at my friend's house mm. um you know when he when he had the uh, release on xbox because this is it, it's it's strange to me um, that it, it, it's the one that you recall as being sort of, you know, so widely available in like, arcades and stuff like that. Because I don't think I wow. probably did see it once or twice, mm. but I didn't. I didn't see it a great deal, and um, so I, I don't know if it's you know it's look at the draw really, depending on what kind of machines you get at different places and such. Um, and it's probably just the case that if it was you know if it's a small cinema like you know the ones around me um you know it's maybe you either get a house of the dead game or a time crisis game and it was probably time crisis that they that, you know they they put in the arcades instead yeah. but um yeah so so my experience with this kind of grown up because I'd, I'd see it in stores i'd see the cover for for xbox and it really felt like it was signaling that you know our arcades were going away in, in, a, in a manner because you'd already kind of you know 2002 you know dreamcast has kind of come and gone and it's you know it's not really there anymore and uh you know arcade arcades were not the staple that they were in the 90s and i was just thinking oh it's like i'm seeing a new house of the dead but i i know it more prominently on a console than i do in an arcade um that's quite strange and 
the thing is, I had an Xbox, but I didn't have a light gun, um, you know, back then. So right. it, I, I never actually got around to playing it in my own house. I could only play it at other people's house. As far as the game itself, I recall us playing it, you know, for a little while. Um, but, you know, my friend had, like, the uh, House of the Dead 2 um, version unlocked or available. Um, we just pretty much played that. I don't know if there was anything that just sort of stop me from getting into this one maybe it was just the the lack of familiarity and it's like oh you've got house of the dead 2 there oh let's play that you know because i know that one hmm. um but i never I, I never gave this one the due attention um that it, it probably deserved and uh i mean i really i really probably should because i think it's available still on psn yes. i do have a playstation move um so uh, yeah i could probably i could probably have some fun with it today so but besides that I really don't know that much about it. It, it looks certainly looks fine. Yeah, I feel like I crapped on it a little bit there. I, I it's, but it is, you know, I had fun with it. Definitely, as you say, it's on PSN right now. Um, so, as with the case of every game on PSN that right now, if you want it on your PlayStation, you probably want to purchase it before it goes away forever. Unfortunately, uh, because that will happen at some point, surely, won't it? Um, Steve, what are your memories and thoughts on House of the Dead Three? Um, so my initial memories are having watched Terminator 2, uh, trying to replicate Sarah Connor's reload maneuver with the House <laughs> of the Dead 3 controller, which is a giant shotgun, and getting told off by the person running the arcade. Um, Gameplay-wise, uh, that's easy. I only really played through it properly uh, in preparation for this podcast because I've got the Wii 2 and 3 collection. Mm -hmm. actually had a fun time, uh, and it's mostly all set in one building, so it actually is a house. Of the dead. True. Yeah. Three. Um, <laughs> I would argue that it's uh, unsung a little. I would argue it's probably the least impactful shotgun a shotgun hath been against zombies in any video game ever. But, yeah, the, the environments and the bosses are actually pretty good. I think attempting to, you know, a, uh, it's a brave move to try and start some significant world building the third game in. Uh, as, but I think we've already said that. But I, overall, I think it's uh, a little undersung. Uh, the the shotgun gimmick is nice, but honestly, uh, I'd rather just have the pistols again. You know, it, it's 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 a cool little toy, uh, and perhaps the best uh, knockoff version of Plant Forty Two I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree with that. I, um, you know, I oh, sorry, go on. I mean, say the, the uh, it, it, I think it's. It's pretty good in the way they actually just like, completely like opaquely shows you pick a level because some of them actually disappear if you don't pick them after a while. I mm. noticed. Uh, so there are stuff. You, there is things you can miss. There is clearly a unique route. I haven't gone through every single level, but I had a fairly fun time with it. Uh, I just think it, out of all the ones I've played, this is definitely one that takes itself strangely the most tonally serious mm. while still having someone pop quips. And it, it, it kind of jars a little, to be fair. I think, the like as I said for House of the Dead 2, the voice acting is so crap, it's endearing. In this one, it's a little bit too, somewhere somewhere between trying too hard, but still being naff. So if you're, there, if you're there for the narrative and plot, which apparently they were trying to build up, eh, no. Gameplay's <laughs> solid, though. Yes. Yeah, it is solid. I think it's funny. I didn't think about it until you said it, but you're right. It doesn't really feel like... Uh, especially if you're playing it at home, obviously, it does not feel like you're wielding a shotgun in any sense. Um, so that's interesting. I mean, in the arcade, you've got the shotgun there, which is nice, and it was unique. Um, but taking that home, you obviously lose that a bit, which is a shame. Um, yeah, it's decent. It's it's a step down, but uh, it's, it's still definitely playable, but perhaps not quite as gratifying as previous entries. Uh, let's... And also, newsflash: uh, Steve broke all the shotguns. Trying yes, to do his, he was the guy. Terminator believer. That's right. In he the was local that... area to me. <laughs> That's why, sure, when you can play it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The mystery's been solved. <laughs> so the next entry is an interesting one. I'm interested to see definitely what people have to say about this one because I have very little experience with House of the Dead Four, which was the next entry to come to arcades. The end of 2005. Uh, in Japan, and then over the course of 2006 elsewhere. I don't, yeah, as I say, I don't have much to say on this one. We swap out the shotgun for a sort of fully automatic assault rifle kind of situation. There's grenades now, which is interesting. Um, and that is balanced, I guess, a little bit by the fact my main memory of playing this, I think once, 
maybe twice, but I think once um, was just there's a hell of a lot more zombies on screen. So the idea being you have this bullet hose to take down as many zombies as possible. Um, but I never really saw this game in the arcades all that much. So that kind of reduces my likelihood of playing it. And it came to PS3 uh, in 2012, which I didn't have a PS3 at that point. Um, so I haven't touched the home version, which is a shame. Perhaps I should go dig into that. Steve, did you ever play House of the Dead 4? Uh, once at a cinema. Mm-hmm. Not in the cinema. There's like an arcade bit inside the cinema. Yeah, that. Um, I, but I, don't, I just think you don't remember getting very far. I had to watch a YouTube video or a few to really get a feel for this one. Uh, so, yeah, my experiences are limited. And it feels like they took the grenades. They literally feel like, I don't know if uh, we've played, we haven't discussed Umbrella Chronicles or Dark Side Chronicles yet. This is the one that feels a bit more like that. Mm. Uh, in a separate button and chuck it out. Uh, and they have taken the criticism clearly from my last moment on the podcast where I said that the voice actor was trying to be too serious by being literally. These are serious voice actors now, but they are being stupid. And that's uh, kind of endearing, hearing a character literally pop off one-liners that are RE4 terrible. <laughs> uh, but the, the the big killer for me is that the UC is boring. And the environments are boring grey, followed by, you know, I, I don't know how to say this, but the zombies becoming more and more photorealistic kind of lose their appeal for me. Mm. I agree with that. Um, I I will be completely honest. I would like to give this another go. I don't know how much it costs to get it off PSN. Um, how much is the cost of my disappointment though? Because when I played this in arcades, I just was like, meh. That was a waste of money. Didn't enjoy that at all. I died very quickly. That probably doesn't help. But I yeah, the gun didn't feel interesting. The environment didn't feel interesting. I just felt like I was having loads of zombies thrown at me. So I I would like to give this another chance. All these years later. But uh, I don't know. Jordan, did you ever play House of the Dead 4 at all? Right, well, I am, I'm turning this car around. We're going back to Winnipeg because <laughs> I absolutely love this game. Um, this this was probably the House of the Dead that I have actually Excellent. played the most, spent the most on, um, and I absolutely love the, the Uzi. I've been... I've been waiting like an hour to talk about how much I love the Uzi. And it, has to, it has to be preceded by oh, this good's crap. Well, let me tell you about that Uzi. No, I, 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 I understand that it's uh, it, it's interesting because you go from Hazard Dead two, three, four. They all have quite different experiences, and they try to kind of change it up with the guns and stuff like that. Um, and depending on what you're after in in these games, um, different guns will suit sort of different experiences. For me, I loved the Uzi. Um, I loved how much ammo you had, uh, but it was balanced out by just how many enemies you then had to deal with. Um, thankfully, this game is, you know, it was widely available um, in my area, and I could probably still find quite a few places in the 25, 30 mile radius that still has this cabinet, <laughs> despite it coming out years and years ago. Um, great to play with friends. Um, I I tried you oiling, but it's not it's not worth it. It just <laughs> just hurt my wrists after a while. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it, it's the kind of uh le- level of sort of action on screen that I, I'm I'm quite happy to deal with. Where it's just kind of like anywhere you shoot, you will get something. <laughs> yeah. But whether or not you get everything in time, that's the real challenge. Mm. Um. But uh, but yeah, I, I particularly love the the Uzis because I'd not I'd, I'd not played any kind of light gun game that that used an Uzi, and I like the kind of the weight of of the Uzi that they used in in the arcades, especially because uh, occasionally you'll have sequences where enemies will get too close to you and you you've got to shake them off, mm. and so the, yeah, there's there, there's some kind of uh, you know function or motor inside the gun that you then obviously have to shake in order to and, and do it long enough to get the zombies off you uh but there's such a weight to that gun that it, it felt it felt really good because it really did feel like you were kind of like pushing away a dead weight and stuff um yeah i mean i, I i'm just kind of gushing on this just because it was one of those experiences that even now i could I, I go somewhere i could i can enjoy it um and i like the uh i, I like the aspect of the sort of the 
it, it's it's a very strange kind of visual upgrade. I know what you mean that it, it's kind of like it, the colors got a little bit more muted and it maybe didn't look as as hokey. Um, but I like that it kind of went with such a sort of distinct art style. So, uh, yeah, I, I I think it's still like one of my favorite experiences with House of the Dead, and it made me feel like House of the Dead Two, House of the Dead Two, did back when it came out. Hmm. Um, so that was exciting because, as I said, with with three, I kind of felt like maybe arcade was falling off the map, and and House of the Dead in in particular was going to get into that very uh, you know, difficult trough where they didn't have a home in arcades and they didn't really have a home um, in consoles because people playing consoles wanted to play FPSs like Halo. Mm. Um, they didn't necessarily want to go out and buy an extra piece of plastic to play one particular game. Right. And this felt like a proper rebirth of the experience. Um, and plus the cabinets were fantastic. Like they're usually pretty big screens. Um, so it, it felt like the arcade experience had grew with me because <laughs> those scre- <laughs> those House of the Dead one and two screens were a lot bigger when I was a kid. Mm. But yeah, they had to kind of grow with it and uh, nice, nice big like rear projection wide screens. It was awesome. No, that's good. I'm I'm glad to hear that because as I say, I had a very short and sour experience with it. But at this point, it's been so many years. I really would like to give it another shot. Uh, it's a little inside baseball, a little bit selfish. Um, I should be going going coastal. That's not a thing, is it? Going holiday to the coast at some point um, soon. And I'm really hoping that it's still the case that I'll be able to find a House of the Dead machine of some sort. I can promise you, no matter which one it is, I am going to play it. Part of me is now hoping that somebody still has a House of the Dead 4 cabinet out there so I can finally sort of come back around on it. Now as an adult with my own you know, money to spend, definitely, I can uh, put some put some time into it. So... You know, maybe I'll have an addendum to this podcast and I'll change my views on it. Sherwin, do you have any experiences with the fourth House of the Dead? No, I'll be honest. I didn't even know it existed. (laughs) Um, I I just didn't know it existed in the slightest. Um, Although, talking about shaking the Uzi to to break away, away from an enemy catching you, that sounds vaguely familiar. So maybe at some point I walked past and saw that, or there's another game that does that, or something that kind of made me think of it. Because as soon as you said that, it kind of triggered some sort of off something in my head. But but I honestly can't. I couldn't tell you anything at all about House of the Dead Four. If I have seen it, I've just completely blanked it. Mm. Well, um, I do think that perhaps it's the game that. I don't want to say it's forgettable, but because also perhaps where arcades were, as George was saying at the time, where it was kind of like definitely on shaky grounds these days. And if I were to go into my local arcade now, really all you've got left is stuff that 100% can't be replicated at home. Uh, House of the Dead had to mix things up. So our next game to talk about has never released in arcade. Uh, It released for the Wii in 2009 uh, worldwide. Uh, it came to PlayStation 3 in the extended cut edition in 2011. It's also on iOS, Android, and Windows, which we've mentioned, which is House of the Dead Overkill, which takes heavy inspiration from Grindhouse, the film genre, and of course the film itself uh, that had just come out. I don't actually I don't know when Grindhouse the film came out, but it was not long since. Um, and House of the Dead leaned at this point very heavily into its ridiculousness, its cheesiness. Um, I think this game at one point had the Guinness World Record for most amount of consistent profanity. <laughs> it's, a, it's a ridiculous, ridiculous thing, uh, especially because it's on the Nintendo Wii of all things when you put those two things together. Uh, Sherwin, what's your experiences with House of the Dead Overkill? Did you ever get to play this one? Not at all. I'm oh. afraid you're uh, you have outstripped my experience. Well, there's that there's the window of my life where I didn't actually play a whole bunch of video games, to mm. honest, and this is firmly smack bang in the middle of that. So um, I'm afraid that's not something where where I can feedback much. I am, however, vaguely familiar. I remember one of my friends. I remember asking about it once, and he just shook his head <laughs> back, like literally about a day after he got it. So that's oh, about the honestly the only thing I can mention to you about it. Fair enough. I mean, I remember there being a buzz about it and people were talking about it, whether or not, that, you know, that speaks of its quality is up to, you know, everyone individually. Jordan, well, do you I'm, have... Oh, sorry. 
was about to say, I'm very keen to hear what you guys all mm. thought of it, because you obviously have experienced it. Uh, yeah. Jordan, have you played Overkill? I sure have. Mm-hmm. Um, beaten it a few times. Um, yeah, it was it was a, a very different experience, um, I would say, to uh, the arcade. Um, obviously, they have to change something about the technology for it to work with the Wii. Um, so now it's uh, you know dependent on a sensor bar, uh, as opposed to the typical light guns, which were which were actually based on the signal from your television. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I, I certainly enjoyed it. Um, it's it's quite a kind of I think because it was basically a console exclusive, uh, it felt a little bit beefier in terms of sort of the 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 length of it. It's almost like they kind of yeah. to justify it as a console experience. They needed to kind of make it a little bit tougher and a little bit longer um, and and kind of add a bit more of replayability to it. But I think it stood up to that. Um, and uh, it was it was a great experience, especially if you're playing, you know, alongside a friend. Mm. Uh, it was the only, the only aspect of the experience that w- could be hampered was depending on how you played it. Because obviously you needed uh, a Wii remote um i don't think that nunchucks were necessary so it was it was treating it as as close to a light gun game as you can get a light gun game uh, on the wii or any modern console these days um but it really depended on how you were using the wii remote if you're using it just as a wii remote it doesn't really feel like a gun as much as we you right. know when we first saw the wii remote we kind of thought oh yeah it'll naturally feel like that and it's it's not quite because of the angle of the of the control and the actual build of it and then obviously a lot of um, peripherals. I say a lot is a, probably an understatement of peripherals for the Wii that were basically just you know white molded plastic. Mm. Um, and so you could get all kinds of gun shaped attachments that you could put the Wii remote into, and then you pull the trigger, and it was a it was a an actual sort of like physical like shaft trigger. So it's literally you pull the trigger back, and it's pulling a long shaft of plastic against the B button. Mm-hmm. And it was a bit, you know, d- depending on the gun that you got, depending on how much you spent on it, uh, it would hamper your experience because it always kind of added that little bit of latency because right. you're still relying on a physical piece of plastic to move. Um, but they, I remember they released sort of, I don't know if it was a, it was official, it was certainly officially branded, was the, the hand cannon, which was like a big kind of like white plastic revolver <laughs> that you could... You could buy in in tandem with the game and play it like that, but it it could have been better. I think if it was in an arcade cabinet, it would it would be you know fantastic. But because it was still reliant on either using a Wii remote that didn't feel like a gun, or using something that felt like a gun but didn't shoot with the same kind of uh, uh, speed and re- and reaction time, um, yeah, it kind of shaved the edges off it a little bit. Mm. But as far as the the game experience, it's a very colourful experience, and and yeah, it w- it clearly was was based heavily on uh, Grindhouse and especially uh, Planet Terror, which I think had come out mm. two years prior. Um, That's the one. And I love it. Like it's 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 you know very schlocky. Um, it's it's clearly kind of based on all those sort of exploitation films, as such. Um, the actual, you know, matter of its content is is quite out there. Um, I mean, especially the ending. Yes. Like me, 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 and my friend Toby would like. I don't think either of us wanted to look at the screen when the ending came along because we're just like, what is going on with this game? But still, it was it was out there. It was it was an outrageous game that I think was exactly what House of the Dead needed to be if it was going to continue as uh, an experience in the Wii era. It needed mm. to be something that stood out as uh, unique um, and fun and wasn't necessarily trying to be anything else or trying to appeal to any other demographic apart from people who just want, you know, an hour of, you know, daft zombie shooting. Yes. They can sort of jump into, play for a bit, and then, you know, move on and, <laughs> you know, just have fun coming back to you every now and then. Um, so... Yeah, as, as, as sort of a, a solid entry with all things considered. Yeah, I agree completely. I think that with the Wii, um, it's all well and good to bring 2 and 3 to the Wii uh, for a little bit of nostalgia, but if you were going to make a new game, you can't just go, oh, it's House of the Dead 5, boom, there you go. They needed to shake things up, and this is definitely the right way to do it. I do agree that it doesn't necessarily feel as good, because you know, playing in the arcade will always feel better 
especially compared to something like House of Dead 4, even though I didn't necessarily like it, what you were saying about how um, hefty the Uzi feels and how you got to shake it around and stuff, you know, going from that to this is obviously night and day. Um, but as, as a game's content, as you pointed out, all the rest is sort of the House of the Dead series, 30, 45 minute sort of long, hour, you know, campaigns, maybe an hour at a push. I don't even think that any of them get that long, which is, you know, you don't want it to be long if, if it's an arcade title. With this not being an arcade title, it's about four hours or so. But that, I think, is the sweet spot for it, really, because it doesn't overstay its welcome. It's still, you know, relatively short for a home console game, four hours. Everything's divided up into sort of its own chapter that sort of feels like it's its own little mini-movie. It's quite well put together. It's it's a neat little package, and, yeah, it's good fun with a friend, definitely. Steve, what are your uh, House of Dead Overkill memories? Did you play this one? Only recently, and oh, again, right. typing of the dead over. Of course, uh, yes. So, yeah. so to speak. Uh, honestly, I had, had a fun time. I feel like this is going to be the one game that it can possibly uh, upset people, offend people, but I suppose yes. that's the point. It, yeah. it, it pushes the boundaries of taste, let's say, mm. and uh, more than a few uh, sensitive topics are handled in a, a manner that probably would have been done in the 70s. Let's put it that way. <laughs> That said, I kind of wish this was still a Nintendo exclusive title, if only for the chance that Isaac Washington could get into Smash. <laughs> or, or heck, even uh, even this interpretation of Agent G. You know, the, the characters themselves are hilarious mm. for what they are. Mm. Uh, if you can get past the the shall we say problematicness to them, yeah. Um, ga- Gameplay wise, this is it reminds me of Umbrella Chronicles. I know I've mentioned that a couple of times, but that's because of the, the way you could develop your weapons and the fact you can carry mm. multiples as opposed to just like having the one and the one and grenades, which is nice. But the zombies themselves, the general zombies are kind of meh. The environments are all right, right and the yeah. bosses are interesting, but the, the regular zombies are kind of bland. They're like, a, they're like the porridge of the whole thing, which is a shame because 90% of this game is shooting zombies mm. and watching cutscenes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's solid, honestly. Uh, I have no complaints. Uh, I was looking this up in preparation of the podcast. This is the uh, the developed out of house one, and it it shows. And they clearly have their own thing. They should clearly roll and run with. I, I mm. feel like uh, we haven't touched Scarlet Dawn yet, but when when we have, there's probably thirty seconds of me. Uh, yeah, Overkill is definitely the methodology they should stick with. Uh, maybe maybe refine it a bit with some of the insight from you know two, three, and four. But yeah, Overkill's all right. Mm. Honestly, it's uh, um, it's funny to me that it never got a sequel or a follow up or anything like that because this is definitely yeah, a direction they could have explored more of, as you say. It had a cultural this, impact at the time. Mm. Is this the one where you kill carnies and find yourself at a circus at some point and other stuff? Yeah, like that, that sounds right. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have played this game. Oh. I did not realize this was a House of the Dead <laughs> game, and that's probably its own statement. Mm. Um, okay, yeah, I've played this game. I vaguely, remember. yeah, it's all right. It's a generic zombie shooter. Mm. That's my honest report. Uh, I just completely don't realise it's a it's a game. I know exactly what it's. It's the fact that you kept on repeating about how tasteless some of it was mm. and the style of it and everything else. The best way I can sum it up, I don't know if it's outside of games. Have you guys ever encountered the term Ameritrash before? Right. Yeah. Um, so Ameritrash is it's just like a mindless zombie shooter. Honest, it's just something where you just if it was a board game you'd just be rolling buckets of dice at something because you like rolling dice mm. it's a similar sort of thing to this it's 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 that idea that you just gun down a whole bunch of zombies and it's just kind of your adrenaline hit for however long mm. this stage takes right i think i think that's the best way to describe what i remember but um yeah i totally did not realize this was a house of the decade <laughs> that's great in the slightest i think it definitely plays I- into that feeling certainly and it's funny because um Several of you have mentioned at the arcade trying to dual wield. Um, as far as I know, this is the only game in the series where that's an option, like a legitimate thing. Uh, once you've beaten the game, there's an alternate play mode where you can use four Wii remotes and each player is invited to dual wield handguns, which is kind of nice. I was just going to say, Sharon, that um, I'm quite impressed that you, you didn't know that it was a House of the Dead game when the, like, the whole title screen has that amazing 70s throwback song where half the lyrics are House of the Dead. <laughs> I, I don't remember that in the slightest. I remember oh, probably it's, being... It's grand. 
Yeah, there are I, some ridiculous I, songs on that soundtrack. I, I worth hate... going back to see if you're a fan of them. <laughs> I really don't like a lot of that. You know, those parts of the soundtrack in this. You know, the level theme themes are fine, but if I remember rightly, one of the, sort of like the menu themes has got dialogue clips from the cutscenes interspersed, and there's like a big massive spoiler in it as well. <laughs> Just kind of dumb, but there you go. Which which one? Which one was it? Which one was it? I really don't remember, but it says something, you know, at risk of spoiling a game from 11 years ago. Um, it, I'm sure it says something about swapping brains or something, which is obviously a part of the sort of final chapter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's they really they really went out there, and it's kind of it's impressive that uh, you know Sega just basically went to this outsourced company and just said, "Here's House of the Dead. Do whatever you want with it. <laughs> yeah. you know, go well, go can't... absolutely crazy." Well, that kind of says perhaps that at that point Sega would just didn't really care that much. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, whatever. It's an old game for a back catalog. Do something crazy with it. It might be Absolutely. that the company pitched for it, and then Sega didn't really care other than getting like the minimum royalty or whatever. Certainly nice that they they did it because obviously, I mean, in this instance, it it turned out well. But like, yeah, like the idea of most companies just you know giving um, giving a property to a, you know, a different developer and, and pretty much giving carte blanche to make whatever they want effectively. Um, uh, yes, it can kind of, it can explode in your face, like, uh, you know, the, the CDI games for Zelda or something like that. But if you actually obviously put it in the hands of people who, who genuinely want to make sort of like a, a new experience that, you know, at least pays homage to where where the roots are coming from, uh, that's great. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that they did it. Um, I would be interested to see, you know, what that company has worked on since. Mm. Um, and yeah, if, if they'll ever kind of like consider doing another console exclusive uh, House of the Dead. Well, the series is in a strange spot. We'll talk about the last game uh, to be released next. But I mean, since you guys kind of mentioned, as Sharon said, perhaps Sega just doesn't care too much anymore. It's interesting because. That was 2009, um, and since, you know, after that point, it's not like they were rushing to follow that up. Um, but House Dead has appeared occasionally in, like, cameos of other games. Project X-Zone, uh, there's a stage in Sega, uh, Sonic and Sega All-Stars Racing, which is the um, mansion. And when I got my second Xbox 360, after my first one got the red ring, it was packaged in with uh, Sega Superstars Tennis, which has a mansion court on it as well. Um, so it shows up in those occasional sort of like Sega celebration games. But it wasn't until September 2018 and October 2018 in Japan and the US, uh, respectively, and exclusively, that the, at the time of speaking, most recent House of the Dead game, Scarlet Dawn, uh, was released and this is arcade only again that is we are coming up on three years now since it came out and it hasn't had a PAL release hasn't had a home console release so that's interesting i suppose the series technically isn't dead as we know because there's a remake coming but we none of us of course have been able to play scarlet dawn because it is arcade exclusive and arcade exclusive not including europe um, Steve, you said you had some things to say about this, so uh, why don't you go ahead? What are your thoughts on Scarlet Dawn? So, looking into this, I uh, had to you know, obviously do the YouTube thing, and some people have either got some kind of arcade port recorded from whatever. And uh, visually, it looks like you're playing one of the Resident Evil CGI movies. <laughs> yeah, like, that's true. And I mean that in both a positive and a negative, but the gameplay looks stodgy, swarmy. Mm. Overly photo, de- you know, overly photo detailed to the point where it's boring. Yeah. And then, you know, and we actually just talked about this earlier, where the game pretty much, the first game gave you, like, the most bare-bones tutorial of don't shoot people, you get stuff. Right? Uh, Scarlet Dawn appears to have the most obtrusious, uh, uh, sorry, atrocious and obnoxious idea for tutorializing a player mid-playing through to waste a player's time, and one of the worst user interfaces I've ever seen. I am kind of blessed that we never saw this game in our, in our physical hands. It's looking awful. I only managed to get through about 30 minutes of someone's playthrough, and I felt like I'd wasted my entire time. <laughs> like, I, I, I don't want to swear. I'm, we've got through this podcast so far, and I have be- behaved and not been a naughty. But it, honestly, it's a complete cluster uh, duck. 
<laughs> you know, it, I, I, yeah. this is a, if I if I'm not a game developer, but if I was to give a, get a lesson in how not to do game design, how not to patronize the player, and how not to do a UI, Scarlet Dawn may be the top. It looks awful. Mm-hmm. Like for as, as as fancy as the graphics are, abomination. Yes. And it kind of worries me, like for the remake of House of the Dead, because the, the 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 level of graphical detail and stuff that rolls into the uh, remake of the original, I just it loses all of its charm to me. I uh, I do agree. I think that, and also I love what did you say, abstrusious or whatever you, the word you just made up. Um, <laughs> I think um, abstruse is what I meant to say. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, just go with it. I think that. This game is a great example of um, where certain engines are at this point. It, you know, I don't know what engine this was made on. If I had to guess, and I can just check, it was made on Unreal Four. But it, you know, the first thing that comes to mind when I look at this is something like Unity, uh, where just you know you can make stuff look pretty, or it's got lighting effects and stuff like that. But the actual game itself, yeah, did not interest me whatsoever. It's very boring to look at, even though it's kind of nice looking. Just nothing interesting about it. Um, if I don't know, it just feels like it was made for the sake of it, which after a, a you know near ten year absence was not a great vibe to give me. Jordan, did you uh, look up any Scarlet Dawn stuff? What did you make of it? Yeah, I've I've, I've been watching the the footage, and I I, I mean yeah, like you know, all of your points stand up that. It, it probably if you're if you're told oh this is the this is the big comeback of House of the Dead, it is it falls a little bit flat. Mm. Um, I don't want to judge it too much just because I haven't played it, um, so I don't know how you know different that experience can be because uh, you know so much of it can depend um, on the cabinet and and the actual experience that you can have. Well, this um, is true you know, in person. Um, I mean, I'm obviously I'm I'm only privy to youtube videos and youtube compression so i don't know exactly how much of it is ended up being muddied just by you know the pure lack of clarity that you know online streaming has compared to uh what you would see you know in person but yeah it's definitely it's it's a little bit kind of washed out and i suppose you know we're talking about you know what kind of identity house of the dead needs or you know what kind of identity house of the dead has um this doesn't necessarily feel like it's finding the pulse where mm. it concerns uh, you know getting something which it goes oh yeah that's definitely house of dead it's like it's almost there it's like it's got it's got some silly aspects to it like you know some some of the enemies are kind of funny just in the way that they're dressed and the way they act and stuff um but i i, I suppose i don't really know where where it's it's meant to go I, you know it's you you don't get that feel it until all of a sudden something shows up and you say okay this is a this is the kind of experience that I would love to see in, in House of the Dead, whereas this is a lot of the stuff where it's like, yeah, it's what we've seen, and it's just a bit more prettier and a, a bit more closer to the kind of visual style and graphics that we're used to today. Mm. Um, I'd love to play it, I'd love to be able to give it a go, um, but uh, obviously, you know, unless you know, you're planning to kind of travel to Asia or you're planning to uh, maybe go somewhere that has you know, managed to import one of the cabinets of which are obviously are going to be very rare. Uh, most of us may not even get to experience this. Um, I don't necessarily think that Sega these days would necessarily feel that compelled to put this on home consoles. I suppose mm. it depends. I guess because obviously they, you know, they are you know remaking uh, the the original. But uh, yeah, it's a strange one, and it obviously comes at a point in time where you know arcades. You know, even in Japan, have taken a battering, and you know, uh, a lot of a lot of uh, mm. locations have closed and stuff. It's surprising that it's even been made. In a way, I'm kind of glad it's been made, even if it's not necessarily the uh, how I imagined the next House of the Dead to look like or play like. I'm I'm glad that it's still relevant. I, I hope right. there are more House of the Dead in the in the future that are maybe you know maybe a bit more ambitious than this. Something that kind of would get you to, uh, you know, part with your money when you're out, uh, you know, somewhere, that, you know, an event or a location or, or what have you, or to go the overkill route and be able to kind of produce something that feels substantial to a home experience. Mm-hmm. So this really feels like a bit of a, you know, a, a fork in the road for uh, House of the Dead in, in terms of, you know, where its future lies. But I guess going with a remake of the original, kickstarting that kind of, 
25th anniversary celebration is at least the right way of going about it um Mm -hmm. because you know you kind of you get yourself back on a bit of a even footing um with regards to how people view you as a as a as a game series and and how they view where you're heading as a game series and how much relevance you still have so just listening to you guys talk about this i wonder how much just just as a complete abstract off of my head kind of haven't really considered this how much do we consider the House of the Dead when it originally came out way back in the day um, and then House of the Dead 2 kind of was at a moment and a cusp where it could have been Resident Evil. It could have been a game which which was considerably more successful than it, had, found it than it was, found its home on a, you know, on a console. Let's say for a moment the Dreamcast doesn't die. Um, mm. And it kind of just missed its window because there wasn't that console because the you know the the portents and the omens weren't quite right, and as a result, it kind of slid into this sort of much more kitschy kind of almost comedic release as time went on, or or kind of lost its way such an, in such a big way um, because it, it was definitely one of those massive influential games when it first landed, and it was definitely something which had much more sense of reverence when you were talking about you know the first and second game. Yes, despite the funky dialogue. And then, at some point, just just disappeared um, and stopped being relevant. And it's a sad thing, and it almost is one of those things where you wonder, well, and appreciate Jordan, we're not, you know, obviously I appreciate you num- like number four so much, but you almost wonder, would it have been better if they kind of stopped at two, and then we would be looking back on this now in a very different way and saying, wow, like that was an awesome game back in the day. I wonder, with much more excitement to us, what's going to come next? Hmm. It's um yeah it's funny because as I said you know with it being out of the two uh, House of the Dead and Resident Evil being the arcade title it felt a little bit like it had less places to go but you're completely right you know if Sega had stayed in the hardware market they would have need to um, keep making their own IPs and their own property new sequels and and really think perhaps a lot harder about them. Not that I'm saying that they necessarily throw everything to one side or whatever and don't give it the time that perhaps deserves when they're sort of producing for, you know, third parties and stuff. But with their own systems, when it's, you know, their neck very much more on the line, uh, yeah, perhaps they really, it could have gone a completely different route. Because as I say, you know, House of Dead does show up in these sort of celebrations of Sega uh, games like the tennis game and the the Sonic All-Stars racing game, which has got characters from... All kinds of uh, Sega titles like Golden Axe and Super Monkey Ball and everything. Um, yeah, I feel like it would be an important notch in Sega's belt. You don't necessarily think about the idea of of it being a big Sega property. When you think Sega now, you really only think of maybe one or two major franchises that they focus on these days. Um, in the alternate universe where Sega made their own Smash Brothers competitor, let's say, because they'd have to take care of their IPs and House of the Dead would have been something that would have been treated differently, whether or not it's better than what we've got. And I would argue that some of the more recent titles uh, have been a bit shaky. Uh, It's definitely something interesting to think about. Um, Yeah, I I, I think genuinely... Yeah, go back to the end of the nineties, and this is one of Sega's big titles. This it is really big, was. Like, this is a yeah. for them. It's. I mean, and at that point, it's how the mighty have fallen. Yeah, you just look at just how, as I say, how many revisions of something like Typing of the Dead there have been, and um, it shows how much Sega was paying attention to what they were doing with their IP and stuff like that. Whereas now it's just yeah, the occasional game. I, I don't know if this is if this is a reach, but I suppose it's worth even, uh, you know, mentioning on on the podcast, you know, since it's. Seems to be quite, you know, affiliated with House of the Dead, or at least was originally like a, a spin-off. But uh, there was uh, Zombie Revenge, yeah, um, the, the arcade and uh, and Dreamcast. And um, while that's obviously it's still it's still very arcadey, mm. it, it, it was from a, a different viewpoint. And I wonder if you know they, if, yeah, if if they had stayed in the hardware market, and maybe something like Zombie Revenge had been maybe. Uh, flushed out further um, if it would then end up going on the same kind of trajectory as Resident Evil. I know it's a massive reach. I know Zombie Revenge is just, you know, a bit of fun from a third person perspective and it's more arcadey, but um, mm. I, I, you know, 
just to throw that out there since it's since a... Sherwin asked about where it could have went yeah, it's a uh, fair as, point. as a series. You know. Streets of Rage with zombies. It, it's it's a fantastic concept. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Resident Evil has done this thing where it's, you know, changed perspectives and changed styles so many times at this point. Um, it certainly could have worked that House of the Dead in this dream universe we're concocting um, tries out a few different things and every few years we get different games from different styles of House of the Dead. Why not? Mm. I know that Steve actually you wanted to mention Zombie Revenge as perhaps your standout is your is it your standout House of the Dead game despite it, the fact that it's a it's a spin-off pre, side story? Pre podcast prep it was. Uh but uh I don't know if I've made it clear really just how much I have uh, come to have an affinity for the first House of the Dead. Uh but th- there's something about that first game that's still sticking with me over, over uh, it's just kind of limped on when I was getting prepared for the podcast and I can't let it go. Hmm. Um, but no, Zombie Revenge. If you haven't played it, or if you haven't seen it, look it up. It's uh, it's it's an, definitely an experience. Uh, my first time playing it was actually I don't think it had a proper arcade release. I don't know if it did or didn't, but I distinctly remember playing it in a uh, a bar in one of those uh, old. It's like you know you can get this demo stands at like game shops where they put a console in it mm. and then they'd have a TV. It was one of those. And uh, yeah, I had a whale of the time. Confused as heck until I realised, oh my god, this is Sega. And then seeing it set in House of the Dead afterwards. But no, it, it's it's a fun little time. It reminds me of Tekken Force mode, but with zombies. I said Streets of Rage. It's more 3D, so it's mm-hmm. it's very similar to Tekken 3's Tekken Force mode, but you're beating the crap out of zombies hand to hand. You know, it's fun. I uh, I'd never heard of this until you mentioned it before we recorded this. So I looked this up, and I yeah, it looks really cool. I'm. Kind of sad I never got a chance to play this. I'll maybe have to see what I can find, find a copy on eBay or something. Um, as someone who's uh, partial to a bit of the Dreamcast, oh yeah, I'd never even heard of this. It, it, it's really interesting. Um, it's very much of its time, but in a good way. Like it's it's super cheesy and super late nineties. I'm really into it. Um, what a name? Yes, yeah, Zombie <laughs> Revenge. And the uh, the original title apparently was uh, Blood Bullet: The House of the Dead Side Story, which it's actually a, a better, well, far better name, but there you go. Um, so that being said, Jordan, what is your standout House of the Dead game then to wrap things up? Yeah, it, w- it would have to be House of the Dead 4. Just for my own personal experience with it, uh, the fact that um, it, it still seems, at least in my area, you know, more widely available than some of the other House of the Dead games, um, and was, uh, you know, a callback to the more kind of like you know mindless fun of of one and two and um especially it felt uh, it's best you know in the arcades uh, and actually kind of you know going there and you know experiencing the new hardware um as and when it came out excellent i'm glad you were here to uh to fly the flag and then, and then to the point where you're like yeah i'm gonna say it's my favorite just to <laughs> i kid uh show and what's your standout house of dead although i get a feeling i know which one uh, probably House of the Dead 2. Mm-hmm. Um, probably an end of that. I, I have the strongest memories of that one. Um, I mean, I have a lot of nostalgia for the first House of the Dead as well. But ultimately, I can't quite break away from the really, really astute point Jordan made, which was a lot of the time you think about House of the Dead 1 and then you realize actually it was House of the Dead 2. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to land back at House of the Dead 2. Yeah, it, that's same for me, really. And I, I agree that... Uh... I'll admit that some of that is definitely nostalgia, but I can mm. just hear the music in my head instantly when I think of it. When I think of House of the Dead, uh, House of the Dead 2 music starts playing in my brain and I start seeing a, a zombie that looks all too much like Kurt Cobain coming at me with two axes crossed over his face, you know. Uh, yeah. I really did put a lot of time into that game, though, so perhaps that's why. But, uh, yeah, looking forward to that House of the Dead 1 remake on Switch all the same. And... Uh, feeling that nostalgia and actually getting to play the original game, albeit a remake, for the first time in in very long time. So very excited for that. Uh, And who knows? Hopefully that will be good enough to perhaps inspire another podcast or perhaps it will inspire further House of the Dead games and we'll circle back round to the series in the future. Nothing else remains for me but to thank our contributors and our Patreons once again. Support the show for as little as $1 a month to help us create more bonus content like this one over at patreon.com forward slash FA Spray Pod. 
You can also join the Discord server to get in touch with members of the team and our community, discuss Resident Evil with us and other fans, and listen to the podcast live as it's recorded. You can find a link to the server as well as our Twitter, Facebook, Twitch, Instagram, YouTube, and more at fasprepod.com. You can find the podcast on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iTunes, and if you enjoyed the show, please do leave us a review where you can. It helps spread the word. Thank you to the panel. You can follow all of the Pueblo people individually. I'm at Sinyak underscore one, two, three. Steve is at FB Steve was taken. Jordan is at Serial Box 64. And Sherwin is at Sherwin's Agenda. And finally, thank you for listening and have a good week. The Japanese arcade industry is a kind of a whole world of its own that if you if you don't paying attention to it, you're gonna come back to you and you're like, wait, that's an arcade game. That's an yeah. arcade game and all that stuff. Um and occasionally the machines find their way over here and you know, they baffle you because you're like, I didn't know they made that. Um but uh, you look at the pachinko machine craze and w- w- over us in the West we're just like, well, okay. Uh, yeah, can we have a new Sardo game? No, yeah, hit the lever. <laughs> But you know what? My favorite Sega light gun game is is None of the House of the Dead. I'm pretty sure they made this one. It is the Rambo arcade <laughs> oh, game. Oh, God. That is Legend. amazing. It's fantastic. If, if there is ever a place that has a, a Rambo arcade machine, I, I play that. And you get, you get a massive gun, obviously, because it's a Rambo game. And uh, it's like all of the events of Rambo 2 and 3. Um you have to hold a bullet belt while you shoot your gun. Is that part of how it works? <laughs> you you don't, but you can definitely pretend that because it's got a rage yeah. mode. Um, oh, so you have to scream while you shoot. Got it. Yeah, there it's is got a big microphone. No, oh, in you it. Yeah. you you can scream with it, but the machine itself screams for you. I'm Amazing. not making this up. It is it is fantastic. <laughs> and, Needs that uh, DS microphone sensor. No, you know, just yeah. that. Uh. <laughs> Well, so you can it's perform that's... CPR on one of your down teams. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if honestly, if you, if you uh, ever see that machine, give it a try. And um, you know, if you're not going to plan to use your arms for the next 24 hours after it, try dual wielding those guns because <laughs> you do feel like a, a character out of Contra um, when you're holding them both at the same time. That's amazing. I did. I so said Rambo, Rambo is the gift that keeps on giving. Apparently, consistently. Yeah. I said uh, I'm hoping that there's a House of Dead cabinet, any of them, when I go on holiday, but I can guarantee now that you've mentioned that game, I'll find a Rambo one instead. I expect <laughs> selfies. Oh, there will be yes. selfies. Yes, <laughs> selfies in a full report, absolutely. Yeah, I'll find, um, a, I'll find like a red tie to wrap around my head before I go play it.